What a fantastic guest we have in store. So I interviewed the current VP of strategy at Zap, the brilliant Steve O'Hare. Uh, Steve is a, an inspirational character. He was a tech journalist working for TechCrunch for uh, around 10 years. And he's been he's been a, a blogger and, and, and a journalist within the tech space through a formative period in the UK tech scene in, and, and certainly in the London tech scene. Steve has, has written articles and has interviewed some of the, the most uh, notable and influential tech leaders in the UK. He's wrote numerous articles on the formation and uh, evolution of companies like Monzo, Starling, World Remit, TransferWise, Deliveroo, uh, you name it. He's, uh, Spotify as well, who we talk about. Steve has tried his hand with a couple of startups. He's started a firm called Beeple in 2011. He's had another brush with entrepreneurialism but he always went back to journalism and, and was one of the most and has been and still is one of the most respected tech journalists in the UK but he put it all to one side in 2021 in the midst of a lockdown and joined uh, his current employer as the VP of strategy and his current employer are called Zap it's, it's, a, it's an amazing company Steve's got a, a brilliant role and, and is getting to put in place all of the stuff he's learned commentating on the industry uh, over the last 15 years. Uh, Steve is a huge music fan. Uh, he's also a Tottenham Hotspurs fan. He's generally a great guy. So it was it was a privilege to, to get him onto the show. Yeah, it's Steve O'Hare. So Steve, thank you so much for coming on the Tech Leaders podcast. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. For those listeners who are unfamiliar with your work and unfamiliar with yourself, uh, could you just give us a little introduction? Probably best known for my work as a journalist in, in tech, in UK tech and European tech. Um, kind of made my name over, I guess, the last 10, 10 15 years covering uh, technology and the way business models were being and, ha- and continue to be um, disrupted. So at TechFront, where I was most recently there for like eight and a half years, I think nearly 10 years in total off and on because I actually went there, worked there twice. I covered European UK startups. That was my main beat. And I was one of the first journalists to write about household names like before anybody had heard of them, such as you know, first to write about Monzo, the Challenger Bank, companies like TransferWise or now Wires. I think I was one of the first uh, journalists to write about Deliveroo. And of course, hundreds and hundreds of other startups, many of which um, didn't go on to become household names, and that's that's the nature of startups, right? Some most fail, but some some go on to become huge companies. So that's probably what I'm best known for. But I've also um, previously founded a startup of my own, raised venture capital. That wasn't a, a, a huge success, but a massive learning curve. And most recently, made my biggest career move to date, which is to join the rapid delivery or on-demand convenience startup Zap. So much to unpack there and so much to talk about there. But uh, what I want to really do, though, Steve, is take you back to the beginning of your career and talk about that sort of time when you got into journalism. What was the motivation and inspiration to get into writing about the tech sector in general? I'm one of those rare people that studied media and actually got a job. But what's, what was kind of fun about that is actually way before um, studying media at university or even GCSE media, I, I wanted to be a journalist from quite a young age, probably more like a music journalist, such as I'm super into music and kind of yeah. when, you, when you're a kid, you know, the, the idea of like reviewing albums or whatever, like and writing about music kind of seemed attractive. And then when I was about 17 years old, I did a work placement at the Guardian newspaper. And from then I was like, I really, I just really want to become a journalist. Now, when I graduated, that didn't happen. Initially, I couldn't find work in, in journalism or in media. And I eventually started building websites for a living. I ended up getting into tech journalism just by virtue of one of the key things about journalism is you want to try to become a specialist, right, in a particular niche. Yeah. Like if, you're, if you're quite narrow, you, it, conversely, you end up with more opportunities than necessarily just being a journalist, well, certainly back then. So, yeah, my, my avenue into tech journalism was as a as a web developer, as a consultant helping at that point, um, a lot of education, move move online and sort of e-learning. I said wade into getting my first couple of bylines as an as an adult, also in the Guardian, quite 
quite ironically or quite nicely. And it, and it went from there. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so tell us about the tech sector at that time then. What was going on in the tech scene at that time? The big new scene was what they called Web 2.0, which was this idea that the web was having oh. a, kind of, a t- kind of renaissance around sort of user-generated content. I guess what we would probably call social media now. So you had like kind of MySpace and then um, and then Facebook was just starting out. And at that point, kind of every website, publication, even e-commerce, kind of all felt it needed to have a social component, right? Some kind of tie-in yeah. with kind of, you know, the social element of the web. And that was when I first got a break at ZDNet, where I wrote a blog called The Social Web. And I was tracking every single new piece of social software and kind of really, really fascinated the way the internet, and obviously this still stands today, is a way of bringing people together in terms of, you know, kind of these niche communities and connecting people from all around the world around their shared interests and passions, right? And so that that was the area I covered the most. And that obviously meant covering startups, right? Because all of the innovation happens on the edge early on, especially around kind of new social software. Um, and cool. so, yeah, so I made a sort of bit of a reputation of, of covering the social web, but I think I spread myself too thin. And um, eventually, I got fired from ZDNet, <laughs> quite <but laughs> unceremoniously. Yeah, yeah, because ultimately I wasn't driving enough readership and traffic, and they got a chain of, change of ownership. So that was a bit of a yeah. sort of lesson into the, uh, the volatility of media. And then I was sort of hunting around for, for the next opportunity, and I got a chance to... Uh, start writing for the TechCrunch European site as it was back then. Like not the best career move at the time mm. because you're writing about companies that nobody really cares about, right? And with a much smaller audience. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, but over time it became a, a really good move because suddenly as Europe's tech scene grew and at one point kind of exponentially, so did my reputation and knowledge and, and the skill set grew in demand within within the ecosystems. It seems like a no-brainer now, looking back at things retrospectively, that the tech sector was going to boom. But it, that wasn't the case back then, was it? You, you know, you look at the world, a list of the world's biggest companies around then. They were all oil companies and, and banks. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Google and Facebook hadn't really made it yet. I think Google might have started, but Facebook hadn't. And Amazon was still early days. It, it was a different world, wasn't it, around then, Steve? Yeah, no, absolutely. And of course, one of the first European consumer tech companies to have a breakthrough was Stripe, right? And Stripe was like one of the, the poster childs. Ah, yes. But for a big cool. consumer-facing company out of Europe that had massive appeal in, in, in the US, so it kind of, you know, it broke the US. But like, it was like the poster child for Europe can build huge, big, meaningful tech companies consumer-facing in Europe, but... It was the only one for ages, right? So at one point, it yeah. became quite a kind of hackneyed sort of, you know, repost to people saying that Europe couldn't do it. And people say, what about Stripe? And I think it was quite quite a few years before the next generation after that came through. Companies like TransferWise that recently IPO'd were started yeah. all the way back when I was at TechCrunch. What sort of tech company do you think was the first big British company to make a statement overseas? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Probably the one that springs to mind is Spotify. Sure. Again, Spotify, you know, not not technically necessarily a UK company, although much of it was built in the, in you know, I believe in London in terms of connecting yeah. to the music labels. But obviously Spotify is another Scandinavian company. They definitely were an like Stripe before them, another example yeah. of a company started in Europe that consumer facing that eventually became a household name in America. And back then, honestly, breaking America was like something that just European companies just didn't do, right? And if they did do it, it was because they were encouraged to relocate entirely in the valley. One of the early conversations yeah. with some of these more ambitious tech companies in the UK and Europe was they would go to venture capitalists and the VCs in America, the bigger, with the bigger and deeper pockets and the more experience would say, hey, love what you're doing. When are you going to move to the valley? Right. And so there was always this kind of, yeah, this brain drain kind of mentality. And it's interesting because I actually interviewed Nicholas Zenistrom, who founded Stripe and is now the founder of the VC firm Atomico. 
and he recalled lots of stories where he kept on was being asked, when will he move Stripe to Silicon Valley? To which his answer was no. And of course, eventually he proved them wrong and made a huge success out of the company. Even now, I think this you'd be hard pushed to find a more successful tech company than Spotify coming out of Europe. They're one of the few companies who took on Amazon and, and actually come out with more market share than them, which is, uh, there's not many firms who can say that, is there? <laughs> no, no, and Apple, right? Apple Music. No, Spotify have done amazing to, to build that brand and then, and then hold their position in the marketplace. Although that said, if you look at the numbers for music streaming in terms of paid for stre- uh, streaming, Subscriptions, I think there's a long way to go. I actually thought you were going to talk about the rise of the fintech in the UK. I interviewed Jason Maud from uh, Starling Bank. I, I always remember him saying to me, he was like, I think our third guest on the show. And he, I always recall him saying prior to Metro Bank, um, which was set up, I think, in the early 2000s or the late 90s, mm-hmm. it hadn't been a bank set up in the UK for 135 years, which was astonishing, really, to think about that now. But Metro banks obviously set up and then we had this flurry of, of, of other challenger banks. And now we've got, you know, it's, it's a pretty congested space these days. So what, what do you think uh, in the fintech space, I mean, with challenger banks and stuff, what, what do you think prompted that, Steve? And, and what's your memory of that period in the UK? It's really in the London tech world because yeah, yeah, it was yeah. an exciting time, wasn't it? It was an amazingly exciting time. And it was probably the area of tech that I went deepest into. Right? Yeah. So. I definitely made a bit of a name for covering all of the fintech companies. Again, super early. So what? Yeah, what prompted those companies? I mean, it was actually a perfect storm. Um, from what I from what I remember, it was a change in regulation. So the, the the UK regulators wanted to find a way to reinvigorate the market post financial crisis. So you had this kind of thinking that financial services were too monopolistic. It was too hard to switch bank accounts. There was a lack of competition around different types of financial products. And uh, enabling some of these new banks to start with slightly lower capital requirements, just so it sort of changed the regulation that allowed, essentially, you needed less money to start a bank. That was, that was one thing. And the second thing, yeah. I, I believe, was kind of the advent of cloud computing. So the idea that you could build a bank that ran in the cloud and didn't need a whole building full of necessarily, you know, secure servers, whatever, you could do it in this more sure. modern way. And I think the third element was just that it was very obvious, especially to non-bankers. So I know Stalin was founded by Anne Bowden, who was a seasoned banker. But if you look at the Monzos of the world, they were started by people that were not bankers, right? They, they Obviously, they had people with banking expertise in their teams, but, I mean, the core founders were, in a sense, from the outside of the financial um, world, yeah. certainly outside of banking. I mean, Tom Bromfield had worked at GoCarders, which is another fintech. But you know, they, these people were not people that grew up working in the banking system. And so from that perspective, it was very clear to them that the level of customer experience of banking was just shoddy. Right? Banks were nowhere near, especially mobile banking or digital-first banking products, were nowhere near the level of customer experience or user experience that consumer-facing apps elsewhere had already achieved, right? So back then in 2015, if you compared the average banking app with with a Spotify, right, with with or with a Facebook or some of some of the some of the leading sort of you know Instagram, whatever, like all these or tons and tons of e-commerce, Amazon, all of these customer experiences were were yeah. so much higher than what the average banking app could provide specifically as the big incumbent banks had got lazy, lazy, bloated, risk adverse, and had really failed to make the transition, arguably from brick and mortar to digital. But even if you did them a bit of a bit of a you know pass there, certainly from desktop to mobile, they had probably failed abysmally. So I think there was this pent up demand from a whole generation of new customers for something that just was so much easier to use and so much higher quality from a, from a digital experience, as I say, coupled with fundamental changes in regulation and the technology shift into cloud computing. And I think they were the three things that, yeah. that, that created the environment for, for some really cool challenger banks. Absolutely. I've never really 
thought of it like that, you know, the, the the cloud computing thing, but it totally makes sense. Yeah, I've never heard anyone explain it like that before, but that's great. So I love this theme of putting you back into this era <laughs> by you, Steve. It's a fascinating time for me, something I'm really interested in. But I, I want to talk about you, get it back to you specifically, because you did something probably a little bit outside of your comfort zone in 2011, 12, didn't you? You set up mm-hmm. a firm called Beeple. Tell us a little bit about that what problem you were trying to solve and how how it how it played out for you i I previously as i said i i've been writing a lot about social software or the so-called social web and people yeah. was a social site consumer facing and it allowed people to come onto the site and ask questions and it would reconnect those questions to people people within the people community that we we or our technology Themes were most likely to be able to answer those questions. So it's a question and answer site. And the way it worked is it tied into Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. So you would link your social accounts, and we would take a look at those accounts, and we would deem what topics you were interested in and which topics you felt you had some level of expertise. And then it had this rerouting system where when people asked questions, what you saw in your feed were only those questions yeah. that you that we deemed you were able to answer best, and it, and it and it worked quite well. I mean, we got when we launched, we got a great amount of PR. We had some great reviews. The user experience is pretty good for a version 1.0. Yeah. It didn't really resonate with users, right? It didn't really have right. product market fit, certainly not in large enough numbers. And that was despite a whole load of really great launch uh, publicity, and and that in itself was a bit of a learning. That even as a journalist, I mean, I should have known better. But PR does not help you fix a product that doesn't have product market fit. And that's, you know, you can throw as much headlines on a product. If it doesn't really solve a fundamental problem for enough people, then then ultimately it's not really going to grow. And certainly not for a venture-backed company. Sure, sure. So what was the biggest lesson you learned, though, from that whole experience? And what did you take from it? Did it make you a better journalist when you were commenting on these companies and writing about these companies? Or, you know, what did you take from it personally? Yeah, yeah. So it definitely, definitely when I went back into journalism, I felt much more equipped to write better stories and to see things in a little bit more transparent way. So even though it may be a little bit more cynical, um, the other side is that it also may be more empathetic. By that, what I mean is empathetic to the journey, the founders and the teams, and not just the founders, the operators. I think that's one thing we talk a lot in tech and the media puts a lot of spotlight on the founders of a company, but there are often you know, tens, hundreds of other people that join that mission and put as equally as much work and heart and soul into it. So when it doesn't pan out, you know, it's not just about the founders. That, that's one. And two, um, I think it may be become very committed to trying to introduce nuance in my coverage and to go beyond just the simple headlines of success or failure. Because having seen the inside track and knowing that these are often quite, you know, when a company makes certain decisions, it's often quite a nuanced judgment call and there isn't necessarily one way of doing it that's right or better. And and, yeah, and and so it built in a lot of, a lot of empathy, but also a determination to try to make the tech industry in the UK and Europe, just a little bit more transparent. It, it, supposing you had a, you know, a friend or something who was going to, you know, has been doing, has been an employee all their life and they're going to, they've got a great idea, they've got some backing or whatever. What entrepreneurial advice would you give to someone who's starting a venture? You know, without being sort of reckless and, 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 and sort of not being smart about it, I think it's to have conviction. It's to, it's to go yeah. for it and do it wholeheartedly so that you can prove or disprove your thesis as quickly as possible. Now, there, there are different ways you can do that, right? It doesn't necessarily mean build a full product and launch with a big bang. In fact, it probably almost certainly doesn't mean that. But on the other hand, it doesn't mean doing two hours every Saturday for, for five years, hoping that you can prove it one way or the other. You have to commit. And there was that saying that used to be banded about, particularly in sort of 2010, a few years was this idea of fail fail fast and i always pushed back and said fail fast but fail wholeheartedly that way you know you know if it's you can prove if you found product market fit and you can prove if there's some enough resonance with your customers and you want to get that answer as quickly as possible 
Otherwise, you can spend years of your life thinking you're onto the next big thing. And, there, and nowadays, there are plenty of ways to test an idea pretty cheaply and, and pretty quickly. So let's talk about the inter-lockdown period, April 2021, although I'm sure this was longer in the making than that. Uh, you decide to have a career change. Let's talk <laughs> about that period in your life then and tell us a little bit about Zap. I guess nearly the first year of the pandemic and the lockdowns, I'd been shielding because of my disability, like if I get COVID, like it's, it's not going to be great, right? So I had been very, very carefully shielding for that for that first period. In fact, even up until now, really. Um, and I had thrown myself even more into work. And during that initial period of COVID, there were so many startup related stories. There were companies having to make fur- you know, do furloughs. There were companies running out of money. There was companies being founded or growing exponentially because of the move from offline to online being accelerated. It was a very sort of turbulent and and an important period of tech. Sure. And as a journalist, I felt suddenly that my role was more meaningful. That you know, that, that, that at any point in time, like journalism was really really needed and valued, including within tech. So I threw myself into work, but by around sort of Christmas time in that first year of the pandemic, I was definitely like burnt out. And I think like a lot of people when your social life becomes an even smaller part of your life and you and work is seems to be everything, you start yeah. to question whether work energizes you, whether it's something you really sure. want to be doing. And I think like a lot of people, you know, they call it the great resignation now, don't they? Like this idea that tons yeah, of people, do. yeah. yeah. <laughs> um I didn't know that I didn't know I was part of that at the time. But um I started to think I I, I want I want to do something different. Certainly I wanted to leave Tech Crunch. And I was putting the feeders out and trying to see, well, what could I do next? Would I want to stay in journalism or maybe take a, a career move, possibly maybe join a venture capital firm? Certainly I was in some early talks around that. That was one idea. I was um, talking to another publication that offered me a great role, and that was super, super tempting. And then conversely, I was trying to scoop Zap's own funding news so that's the company that I eventually joined. And cool. in that conversation with the founder, where I was trying to like kind of nail the details of this funding round. And the founder I'd known for many years because I covered one of his early companies. And so I said, Hey, look, just so you should know, I think I might be leaving Tech Grant. So give me give me your news. I want the details. Let me help with you. Let me get this story over the line. Because I was basically on, I had enough to probably run the story anyway. And yeah. um, and he said, Well, why don't you come and join our team? And I said, well, what would I do? What's a journalist going to do? A uh, fast-growing, rapid delivery style. We talked and talked and talked. Realised there was there was a role for me for me there, and tried to define what what I would do do best. And yeah, like you said, um, pretty quickly, I made up my mind, and yeah, and and joined Zap as VP of Strategy, which is amazing. Transition from yeah. journalism into like a, a really fast-growing company. I mean, we're now about just over a year old. So I joined pretty early, but it was still seven months in and it's worked out great. I love what I do. I love my job. It's so energizing to work with the talented team we have and the speed at which we're growing. Yeah. So it, it it's worked out well. And you said, you, you sort of just said earlier, you thought it was probably quite a many months in the making. It really wasn't. It was, it was super it quick. It was pretty quick turnaround, yeah. was yeah, it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> So tell us about Zap then. What 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 like I said to you earlier, what what sort of problem do you guys solve and why do you think Zap are gonna, you know, change the uh, the convenience retail space in the UK? Yeah, sure. So we let customers order drinks, snacks, essential groceries and other household items, even including over the counter medicine, you know, baby products, twenty four seven for delivery within minutes. You know, broad customer promise is delivery within 20 minutes. So the idea is that our app lets you order things that you want right now. So kind of addressing spontaneity and urgent need use cases. And as you said, playing very much within the convenience retail sector. And when you think about it, convenience retail is one of the last bastions of e-commerce. So in other words, it hasn't really seen that offline to online shift that other areas of commerce have seen. Massive addressable market. I think it's about forty-five billion pounds in the UK alone 
of which the majority is in London. Um, and yeah, it's definitely an exciting space. And Zap so far since launch, launched late 2020, has really resonated with customers and we're, we're, we're going um, amazingly well. And yeah, it, it's, it's really exciting. You're in London at the moment. I know you've put a lot of money into marketing the brand across London. I saw yeah. you on a bus. I told you before. What's the plan for global domination? Then are you gonna are you gonna take this international soon? Yeah. So we're also growing very fast in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. So our our, key, our main key cities at the moment are London, Amsterdam, and we are pursuing what we call a sort of convenience mega city strategy, which is to initially go after cities that are large enough with high enough population density, where there's already a proven demand for convenience. In other words, these cities have strong offline convenience markets, allowing us to basically hopefully get you know, to a, on a path to profitability from, from, from doing more concentrated bets in big up a smaller number of locations yeah. compared to some of our competitors. And what's really key to that is our long-term mission is to build an entirely new kind of supply chain, right? So if you think about it, we we have you know central distribution centers, we have our local Zap stores. They're the micro fulfillment centers that are, that are close right. to where people live to be able to meet that that twenty-minute promise. And we also have yeah. our own fleet of employed riders, so we're not a gig economy. All of our riders are employed. So in that sense, that's like a fully vertically integrated approach where we are yeah. both the retailer as well as the delivery service. And that's sure. what allows us to really raise the bar on customer experience. That, that, that does sound like you are very much set up for cities, though. Is that fair to say? Or do you think this can go out to, to the rural areas of maybe the UK and other countries in the future? So the model as it stands right now definitely requires a level of population density to where, where obviously it works in cities, 100%. That doesn't mean that, you know, there aren't different variations of how you might deliver a, a convenience retail experience and make it work. But certainly the, the current model we have is very much geared to mega cities in particular. Yeah, for sure. But I tell you what can change that, Steve? Drones. <laughs> Bet you that's where you'll be in a couple of years. Everyone will be whizzing around on drones. <laughs> but maybe we can talk about that another time. But but look, you know, it sounds really exciting. It, the the convenience retail space seems to be where you know, it's, as you said, this is the last bastion of e-commerce, and I think it's uh, it seems to be there's a lot of innovation in that space right now, and there's a lot of competition. But it's a massive market, isn't it? So let's talk about a bit, a bit more ge on, in general terms. Then, what 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 are you most excited about in terms of technology innovation right now, Steve? Globally, what what excites you the most? So I think the space that I'm looking at, in a way, partly through Zap, because we built sustainability yeah. in our model from the get go. Um, and in fact, we have a head of sustainability that reports directly to me. So that's also kind of uh, made me focus more on this area is I think climate change tech. And there's going to be a whole wave. It's already happening. A whole wave of tech startups. Again, people that maybe aren't even from, you know, the sustainability sector coming with fresh, mm. fresh eyes and a certain amount of naivety, really thinking hard about how to solve the climate crisis and how to kind of align, um, you know, venture capital and these big outlier bets with solving yeah. some of the biggest problems that the world is facing today and in the next, you know, in the next really few years. So I'm definitely spending a certain amount of time tracking like various products and they can be like some of the really big bets like, uh, like carbon capture, right? That's like a kind of yeah. moonshot type bet. And other, other ones can just be solving much more practical problems like, for example, why is it today that, you know, sustainable packaging, right, isn't, isn't a cost that it can compete with existing packaging around products? You know, there's quite a lot of, yeah, sure. there's quite a lot of problems that are being solved, and that is one of them, where you just know that the next startup that can make a breakthrough in that area is is going to have um, a really sizable impact, and that's a massive, massive, massive problem. And it's that's one of those tech problems where you've got the macro problem, climate change, 
but that impacts every single industry and every single product. So, yeah, I was going to say, Steve, I think, um, can you imagine how many people have been sitting at home thinking about business ideas? We've got a lot of, you know, throughout the lockdown period, you know what I mean? We have got a lot of problems, but we've got a lot of very smart minds concentrating on solving these problems. So I think, uh, but those points you just mentioned, that there's a lot of innovation out there, I'm sure, to come. So I just wanted to ask you about yourself and, and some, you know, you've had an amazing career as a journalist. You, you've obviously seen probably one of the most exciting periods in the history of the UK in terms of business innovation in general and technology innovation, certainly. So I wanted to ask you if, if you were sort of advising sort of like a young person who wanted a career in, in, in journalism, not necessarily in the tech space, but, you know, uh, just you know, a career as a journalist, as a writer, what, what advice would you give? When I get, I get asked this quite often, the way to yeah. break through into, into content journalism, it's going to sound so obvious. It's just to start doing it. But like you definitely hone your skills. <laughs> Stop talking about yeah. doing it and actually yeah. doing it. Which is... <laughs> um, the way to become a good writer is, is to read. You need to read a lot. Like, um, it's funny because both my parents were English teachers. And when I was a kid, I was known for not reading nearly enough in their eyes. Um, so I managed <laughs> yeah. to still allegedly become a writer. So you definitely want to read. But also, you know, nowadays there's no um, barrier to publishing, right? You can start a blog start a medium and just start writing. And, sure. and, and the biggest key is that the smarter stuff you write, especially around sort of niche topics, if you can find a topic where you feel somebody isn't writing smart enough stuff on or isn't writing with a fresh voice and, and focus on that, I think that's the way to get noticed. Because in the end, one of the great things about journalism or, or writing is that you really are, you know, there's nowhere to hide, right? You're basically only as good as the words you write and and the way you uh, can explain ideas and and capture um, what's happening around the world or in the world is through is through what you publish, and that's the great thing. So in that sense, whilst I'm not like naive enough to pretend that the journalism industry is meritocratic to any extent to what it should be, certainly the proof is in the pudding to a certain extent. So yeah, just start writing, find a subject you're passionate about, try and become an expert, reach out network, trust the voices that you that you record in your pieces, you know, the, the sources and the experts. And yeah, just try to like establish yourself as a bit of an expert in a, in a, in a core subject. Well, like, let me finish on this one then, Steve. So what, what sort of book or anecdote or sort of uh, story have you been inspired by? So this difficult question. I think the one, so have you seen the, the documentary on Netflix? I think it might be on Netflix. I can't really talk, but there's like a documentary on the founding of Netflix uh, that I watched recently. It was really, really good. Recommend people checking that out. What was this? Sorry, it's a documentary on the founding of Netflix. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right, on how, oh, they, okay. on how they beat Blockbuster. And so oh, forth. wow. Yeah. So it's a Netflix documentary about Netflix. That's... Uh... It, might, <laughs> that would be... it might even be on Amazon Prime. I don't know, but it's basically... <laughs> that would be ironic, it? <laughs> Let's make it simple. Okay, there's a great documentary out there on Netflix and how it disrupted... Yeah, yeah. Blockbuster, so how it sort of disrupted the the offline movie rental business as it moved online. But it the yeah. reason why it's good is it's very, very messy. Like they didn't win easily. I mean they won emphatically in the end, but it's it's a yeah. really it's a really messy, true story with a couple of elements where they're a little bit too soon. And you asked me earlier mm. about what can make or break a business and yeah. timing is everything. Being too soon is as bad, if not worse, than being too late. Yeah, um, yeah. it's crazy that is, though, mm-hmm. isn't it? And so many companies have done that. Uh, you must have heard the Kodak story with digital cameras. The, the, Kodak invented the digital camera, didn't they? And then, and then I think they put it into the market and then pulled it because they realized that um, it was disrupting their s- films business. So that, But their competitors jumped on yeah, it and yeah, then yeah. put them out of business, <laughs> <laughs> which is crazy. Classic innovators dynamic, isn't it? There's a whole book yeah. on that. Um, it's interesting. One of the first things I really learned about business really early on, and I can't remember where I read it. I wish I had the original source, but it was like this idea that you have to ask yourself, what business are you really in? And this is a, this sure. is the state the companies make. And the analogy that was used is, if you think about the postal service, if the postal service understood that the business it was really in was communication 
then yeah. perhaps it would have invented email. Absolutely, yeah. Do you find that there's people who've worked in industries their entire lives and they don't, they get it wrong in terms of what they're actually doing? A guest was telling me the other day that her partner was a plumber and their website had a picture of a boiler on it. And she said, why have you got a picture of a boiler? And he said, well, that's because that's what I do. And he said, it may be what you do, but it's not what you sell. You sell a warm home and convenient water flow and stuff like that. You don't sell, bo- you know what I mean? It's like <laughs> you're selling that dream of, 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 you know, efficiency and whatever, you know, and a warm house. But in his mind, he sold the, the act of, of fitting a boiler. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. like, but it's just, it's just perception, I suppose, isn't it? And where can people find you and where can they reach out to you? And, uh, you know, uh, where can they read some of your older stuff and, and obviously check out the, the stuff that Zap are up to as well? Sure. So you can find me. Uh, and my personal website, which is ohear.net, O-H-E-A-R dot net, or on Twitter, which is at S-O-H-E-A-R, so S-O-H-E-A-R on Twitter. Steve, I've really enjoyed this one. Thank you so much for coming on and uh, talking to me. I know you're really busy at the moment with everything that's going on at Zap, so I really appreciate it. Thank you for coming on the Tech Leaders podcast. No, no, thanks so much for having me.